Our aim this morning is to worship. Uh, our, our aim is, is to consider something of such greatness that the only right response is to bow our heads in adoration. They say you can have too much of a good thing, but that is not true when it comes to the Lord Jesus. We can never have too much of him. Now we've just read Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 to 46, uh, and we're not going to be considering all of the details in this passage, um, but what we're going to be thinking about is Jesus's sorrow. It's not easy to watch someone in agony, uh, but what this passage shows us is someone, and not just anyone, it shows us the Lord Jesus Christ, it shows our beloved Saviour in agony. Uh, in order to look at this we need special help from the Spirit. So I'm going to pray and ask for that. The Holy Spirit of God, please would you aid us in the opening of our eyes to see the Lord Jesus and to adore him. Amen. Verse 37 says Jesus began. What do we see? Well, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he tells his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And then he falls and he prays. Now, what was the agony he was experiencing? Well, well, the answer to that comes in verse 39. In verse 39, in his prayer, he says, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Now, what is this cup? Well, imagine that you're, you're walking down a street and you, you hear a cry. Uh, and, and you see a man rush across the street, grab a child and start to beat them. If we saw that, then there would rise within us a burning indignation. Now, in, in all of us, there is something of a righteous anger. Uh, and if we were indifferent to things like that, then we would somehow be less human. And yet, of course, we are only human. Uh, and the Bible tells us of a holy God who cannot bear to look upon sin. Uh, a God who sees every atrocity, every injustice, every wrong. And he reacts with righteous anger. Uh, this cup was often mentioned in the Old Testament. In, in Isaiah chapter 51 it is called the cup of the Lord's wrath. And what this cup represents is a concentration of God's holy hatred of sin. So what is happening in Gethsemane? In Gethsemane, Jesus prays, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. You see, that cup in the hand of the Father uh, that cup of his wrath is being passed to Jesus. The, the cup is being held out to Jesus and he considers it. The, the cup isn't being forced, it is being presented. And, and you can imagine at this moment that the whole of creation, all of the heavenly powers, hold their breath to see what Jesus will do. Uh, the answer is, to what Jesus will do rides on the word possible. He prays if it is possible. Now, now what's Jesus thinking here? What, 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 what's he thinking? Is it possible for what? You see right back before the beginning of time God who is one in the mystery of the divine council he determined and purposed the whole course of redemption. The whole plan of redemption from creation through to new creation. And at the centre was this, uh, of that eternal pact between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Right at the centre was the saving mission of the Son in the person of the Christ. And so when Jesus was born, Matthew tells us, 
that he was given the name Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. And now he prays, is it possible for the cup to be taken away? Well, the answer is no. Not if he is Jesus. And that not if he is to save his people from their sins, then it is not possible. The offer of this cup is the offer for Jesus to take on himself the sin of his own. And so Jesus says, yet not as I will, but as you will. He says, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And as it were in those moments, Jesus receives the cup. And the drama that we see in the Garden of Gethsemane is the offer of the cup and Jesus' submission as he receives it. Now, now how does that under, help us to understand his sorrow? See, from the moment that Jesus takes the cup, from that moment on, he is now counted as a sinner. Now imagine what a, a kind of an onlooker would see after Gethsemane. And what an onlooker would see is they would see a man being arrested and then a man being tried before the authorities and then a man being condemned and sentenced and that sentence being carried out. Now we know that that system was corrupt, we know the charges were false, we know the judge was a coward, but all of those outward acts that fold out after Gethsemane, all of those acts that show Jesus adopting this role, taking on the part of a guilty criminal. And that's exactly what Isaiah had foretold hundreds of years beforehand. Uh, Isaiah had wrote that he was numbered with the transgressors. Uh, Isaiah wrote that the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Or, or as Paul would go on to write to the church in Corinth, God made him who had no sin to be sin. In Gethsemane, Jesus is overwhelmed because he is made to be sin. Now, what effect would that have had on him? You see, for us, we know the taste of sin. And we know the feeling in our gut of filth. We know the feeling of shame. But up to Gethsemane, Jesus did not know sin. He had no sin of his own, but as he took the cup, he owned the sin of his people. See, the thing that was most abominable to the holy heart of Jesus, that was what he became. That the pure conscience of the Lord Jesus was polluted. Now, what was that like for him? Now, if, if we try to imagine for ourselves that if all of the shame and the guilt of our whole lives was to be experienced in a single moment, now, I don't think that psychologically we could bear that. But when Jesus takes the cup, the sins that were not his own, he owns them. And, and it's not the sin of one sinner. No, to, to, to own in a moment that the shame and the guilt and the filth of one sinner, of one life, would be too much. But Jesus, in that moment, owns the iniquity of us all. All the guilt of all the church from all time now weighed upon his shoulders. Now we might wonder how much of this we can grasp. Maybe it's a bit like an eye test. In, in an eye test, you're asked to read smaller and smaller prints until you just can't see any more. 
know, we know there is more, but we can't read it. Now, as we look into the agonies of Jesus, we get to a point where we just can't see any more. But perhaps though we can, we can look at it from a slightly different angle. Now, we might think about something of a contrast. You see, that verse that I mentioned in 2 Corinthians, it, it goes on to give the other side, the contrasting side. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In Gethsemane, when Jesus received the cup, he was made to be sin. He owned sin that was not his own. And the purpose was so that we who know sin so very well, we might be made righteous. We might own a righteousness that is not our own. You see, once Jesus had taken the cup, once he was made sin, he was now headed to receive what sin deserves. And yet in the same way, once we are made righteous, we are now headed to receive what righteousness deserves. And this is, this is the whole design of the gospel. God planned this great exchange where our sin would be counted to Christ and Christ's righteousness would be counted to us. And, and our part in this, the only part that we play in this is we bring our sin. And we trust Christ. We trust Christ for the forgiveness of our sin. And it's by our believing on Christ that we join into this great exchange. And, and as we participate in it, as we join in the exchange, what does it mean for us? Well, David in the Psalms cries out, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. And he says, Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. And we who have come to Christ for forgiveness, we have joy in the Lord and we can be glad. And we've begun to taste that blessedness, haven't we? We've begun to experience that joy. And I, I know that our joy kind of stutters along the way. But what the Bible promises is that we are heading towards eternal joy. We are heading towards endless pressure endless pleasures because that is the right reward of the righteousness that is counted to us in Christ. We're headed towards real solid joy. We taste a little of it now, we get the first drips of it now, but in the world to come we will know it in its beautiful fullness. And all of this is because Christ's righteousness is counted to us. It's not our own righteousness. We haven't performed it, but we own it because of Jesus. And the result is real joy, our real joy. But so we can consider the contrast. Christ takes the cup and is counted to be sin. Not his own sin, but he owns it. And by owning it, he comes to experience the counterpart, the opposite of our eternal joy. He comes to experience the full force of sins, shame and guilt. And brothers and sisters, this morning we are to see that this is our Jesus. This is our Jesus as he is face down on the ground, overwhelmed by sorrow, even to the point of death. This is our Jesus and he is most worthy of our worship. In this current time of upheaval, in this time of crisis, there is this this kind of empty kind of pos positivism which is being kind of banded around and, and the message is you've got to think happy thoughts and play down the sorrow but I think we should be very wary of this because I think it has the danger of robbing us of real joy now what brings real joy to people like us and what's the only way for people like us to have a lasting hope of pure happiness? It doesn't come by playing down the sorrow. 
Uh, the only way is through the agonies of Gethsemane. And then when our Jesus went to Calvary and he drank the cup and he drank it down to the dregs, as it were, he lifted up the cup and he turned it upside down to show that it was empty as he cried out, it is finished. I see the struggle of Gethsemane is where our precious Jesus became sin for us. So let's consider him. Let's consider him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And let's consider him our beloved Jesus, our hero, our saviour, our brother, our king. And the king who plunged himself into this sorrow so that he might lift us into joy unspeakable. And all the glory is to him forever and ever. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, would you cause us to consider long and often the fullness of our Saviour, even in the unspeakable agonies of Gethsemane, that we might adore him and worship him all of our days. Praise you and thank you for all that he did. Amen. <laughs>